What separates us from the animals, what separates us from the chaos, is our ability to mourn the people we've never met. A very warm welcome to everyone, our esteemed dignitaries, and the guests who've joined us in the memory of the 9-11 attacks. I, Nikita Chandu, a research coordinator at GCP, along with Mayuri, my co-host, are going to be a host for these. The global community has faced various imminent threats from the acts of terror across the globe, starting from the 9-11 to the Amsterdam blast, the attacks of 26-11, the terror attack in Dhaka, Palwama attack on India's security, security forces, and the recent Beirut attack. Innocents have been terrorized by uncertainty about the future, and thousands still live under the shadow of terror. But let's not forget about the role of hope that has various leaders across the globe have instilled in us. Good will preside over the evil no matter what happens. And that's how the nature works. The magnitude of doing a good job, a good deed, is innumerable. And we should all work together as one to make every citizen believe that good over evil trumps every day. Today in our panel, we have various esteemed speakers, and I would like to introduce them. We have David Smith, a senior director at Research Analysis at, at Terrorism Research and Analysis Consortium, a former senior advisor to the U.S. Department of State. He handles strategic public affairs, having expertise spanning military, government, and corporate landscape. He currently provides advanced strategic communication support as a member of the interagency team in the Army Commission Command Training Program, Devon World. Additionally, adjunct faculty combating terrorism planner a joint special operations university, Magdal AFP with extensive international experience in information operations. He's also an advisor at Terrorism Research Analysis Consortium TRAC. We welcome you, sir. We have Dr. Vesna Markovic, who has developed a robust career in criminal justice, focusing on terrorism and other attack, uh, other areas of organized crime. She began her professional career in academia as an assistant professor at University of New Haven, and eventually became an assistant director at Assistant Dean for the College of Criminal Justice. She also served as a principal investigator and obtained several grants for the institution and at Sam Houston State University prior to that. Upon obtaining her doctoral degree, she became the director of the Institute of, for Study of Violent Groups. Previously worked as a private, invest, private investigator doing corporate due diligence investigation at Search International. We welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Yuan M. Wissing. Dr. Wissing received her undergraduate degree in sociology from Indiana University at Bloomington. She received her graduate degree from Western Michigan University, and she was awarded a National Institute for Mental Health Postdoctoral Research Fellowship. She's the author of four books with more forthcoming. Dr. Wissing is an expert in the area of homeless children and youth and works closely with the National Coalition for the Homeless. The founder of SSC's Center for Child Studies, she's active on the international level working for children's well-being. We welcome you, ma'am. Lieutenant General KJ Singh is a self-made outstanding scholar general with a proven track record. He's currently the State Information Commissioner after his stint at, 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 as advisor, Ayana Garment, member of Chandigarh UT and Panchkula Advisors, Advisory Council. He has experience at apex level in fields of defense at strategic level, military diplomacy, including peacekeeping, prospective planning, and capability building. Regularly con he regularly contributes articles and columns in Times of India. He has been awarded PVSM, AVSM, and BAR to AVSM, multiple commendations for distinguished service and bravery for service in India and abroad. His nearly 40 years of experience includes Western Command, his strongest command with responsibility for Park and Chinese borders, including counter terrorist operations. He has effectively contributed in PX broad level decision making structures and set up the first think tank, Gyan Chakra and Gyan Setu. Welcome, you, sir. Dr. Madhav Das Nalapath. Professor Madhav Das Nalapath is the Director of Geopolitics and International Relations in UNESCO Peace Chair at Manipal University in India. He's also editorial director of the Sunday Guardian and ITV Network India. 
and vice chair of Manipal University Advanced Research Group. He has been editor of Times of India and editor of Matrubhumi. Dr. Nalpath writes expertly on international affairs and appears regularly on global media as respected authority on geopolitics. Welcome you, sir. This session will be chaired by uh, Mr. Pankaj, Professor Pankaj Jha, who is an associate professor and associate dean researcher at Jindal School of International Affairs. Dr. Pankaj Jha was director with Indian Council of World Affairs for more than two and a half years. He has worked as deputy director with National Security Secretary and was closely associated with national security apparatus in India. He has a member of high level delegations to and Israel and other countries. He has been visiting fellow with Center for International Security Studies University, 2009 and Institute for South Asian Studies in 2006. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. With this, I hand over the stage to Pankaj, uh, Professor Pankaj Jha. Uh, uh, before we embark, uh, I just wanted to confirm with regard to panelists, uh, we have uh, Lieutenant General K.G. Singh, uh, who will be joining slightly late, or is he on? Uh, He's on with us, sir. Okay, good. Professor Madhav Nalapath also, he is around, uh, uh, along with us? He's there. Yes, uh, Thank you, thank you. And uh, Yovone M. V. Singh, PhD, she's also yes, with us? Yes, she's also with okay. us, sir. Okay. Vesna Markovic, she is also there? Okay. Okay, and David Snap. Okay, so yeah. we, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, a very good evening to all of you. For those who are in US, it's a good morning to all of you. Uh, the topic for today's talk is, uh, is quite vast, you know, and looking into the profile of most of the people that have joined us, we have people who have been uh, associated with uh, UNESCO Peace Chair. We have people who are lo looking into the legal and policy aspects of it. Then we have people who have worked with regard to child uh, and, and woman uh, involvement in different spheres. And we have a practitioner in terms of uh, Lieutenant General K.J. Singh, who is really talking about uh, the terror, different aspects of terrorists uh, from, from, from how they really behave, how they really counter these type of things, and what exactly are the, uh, are the problems that usually is being say, uh, you know, faced by the government agencies in this regard. Uh, so we start the first with uh, uh, with the person who has been uh, uh, one of the prominent persons dealing with these issues, and we we uh, invite David Snap, the senior director, Terrorism Research and Analysis Consortium USA, and former senior advisor, U.S. Department of State USA. Uh, uh, welcome, Mr. S uh, David, and uh, over to you for your remarks on the very critical and very important subject matter. Thank you. Over to you, David. David, you are on mute. Kindly unmute yourself. There. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to join everyone and really appreciate this opportunity. I definitely want to reach out and say thank you to Adi, who has been so nice and being patient with me. Uh, through the last several months as we tried to schedule uh, some of these conferences and just want to thank the Global Counterterrorism Council for putting all this together. It's such an important day uh, for all of us to remember. It doesn't matter uh, if you're in the United States or India. Um, all of us can go back 19 years and kind of visualize where we were uh, at that moment. And I think just beginning this morning uh, here in the United States, I'm on the East Coast, uh, it's about 9.47, and um, a lot was going on in New York 19 years ago at 9.47 a.m. Uh, at 9.59 uh, a.m., just a few minutes from now, uh, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. And so it was all those moments that we all remember, and we all can look at all the, the video as we go through the retrospectives uh, over these last years. Um, and, and we know where we were, we know what we were thinking, and we know uh, how we were feeling for uh, the people of New York and Pennsylvania and the Pentagon. So I don't want to spend too much time going back that far. I think what we're here to do uh, today is to try to take some uh, conversation and discussion 
about what we've learned since September 11, 2001, and we fast forward it to where we are here uh, in 2020. For me, I think that we all know that uh, leading up to September 11th, uh, we had real conflict in the United States uh, in terms of the infrastructure, uh, the intelligence infrastructure and the law enforcement infrastructure meant to kind of give us all a heads up uh, to the bad actors that may have been uh, uh, meandering around the United States at that time. Um, the, the legendary conflict between the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI has been well documented. The 9-11 Commission uh, released its report several years after 9-11, and it documented those infrastructure problems that we had in this country in terms of communicating with each other and also the ego problems that we had in terms of one agency vying for power and influence over another. Uh, and some of those mistakes certainly led up to uh, what we saw, not only, uh, you know, 9-11, but some of the other incidences that had to, to uh, do with uh, global terrorism at that time. Uh, I think that, you know, we all listened and, and read the 9-11 report back then and hoped that things would congeal and get better. From my perspective, there have been vast improvements in the way that we monitor and collect and analyze data uh, so that we can protect our societies, uh, not only here in the United States, but across the world, including India. Um, a lot of those changes that were made because of 9-11, both in terms of intelligence infrastructure and law enforcement infrastructure, um, have been well documented, and I think um, we don't need to spend too much time on those. From my perspective, um, one of the vast changes that came out of September 11th and is still in a process of continuing to evolve and improve is the concept of the Joint uh, Information Intelligence Fusion Centers. In the United States, after 9-11, we, we constructed the infrastructure needed to gather information and to share information. Um, those efforts are ongoing. Uh, here in the United States, what we've seen in the last 10 years or so are states starting to develop their own uh, intelligence fusion centers where they're bringing in all, all amounts of data and information from disparate sources, including law enforcement or judicial or, or even political, and bringing that information together so that they can understand better the threats and risks uh, that are out there that any, any city or town or state uh, might face in the future. So those uh, intelligence fusion centers, I think, are, are one of the improvements that we've seen after 9-11. Because from my perspective, uh, information is power uh, and information sharing uh, is so critically important to our understanding of global uh, terrorism and how to counter it. Um, my work with the US government uh, extending back to 2010 in Afghanistan, uh, I was there for four years, started in 2010 and left in 2014. And in that four year period, uh, we, we improved upon uh, information sharing and intelligence gathering and actually working together to uh, deconflict and synchronize uh, information in a way that could be uh, handled. Uh, and, and I think that uh, some of you are, have been very, very uh, involved. I know the general has been very involved in the information environment, trying to understand at any given time the various actors that are moving. Uh, out there. From my experience in Afghanistan in 2010, the U.S. government made a concerted effort uh, to, to share information with our NATO partners and allies there in Afghanistan, but also with the, uh, the Afghan government. Um, I was intimately involved in, in one of those um, issues where uh, I was a member of what was called the Security uh, Coordination Center, Security News Coordination Center, uh, this was an effort that General Petraeus implemented so that we could deconflict, synchronize, align uh, battlefield information directly with President Karzai's office uh, at the presidential palace in, in Kabul. Um, that effort, I think, uh, went a long way to the shared information environment. 
uh, we are at the time dealing with um, both Al Qaeda and the Taliban in terms of their information and propaganda efforts. Uh, and some of those uh, joint efforts that we developed at that time became very productive and they're being carried forward, not only in Afghanistan, but other places where the US government, US military is operating. So from my perspective, uh, September 11th, um, I look back and I think, oh, well, um, a lot has changed. Uh, there are some things that have not changed. I think we do have a long way to go in the United States in terms of our collective understanding of bad actor, of, of malign actors, of, of global terrorists, of extremists, uh, which we're facing in this country right now in terms of right wing and left wing extremism and, and understanding how to track those threats. And uh, as the general knows, uh, a lot of that information is now um, shifted into what we call open source intelligence. Uh, and that's where the uh, Terrorism Research and uh, uh, Analysis Consortium, of which I'm associated with now, um, has some expertise in terms of monitoring and collecting and understanding those threats that are coming over social media platforms such as Twitter or Telegram, or now even TikTok, uh, which is um, being used by extremists uh, to propagate um, uh, their information and their propaganda. So for me, those efforts in terms of inform the information environment are the most critical lesson in my professional world uh, in terms of understanding global uh, terrorism and how to counter it. So with that, I'd just like to again thank everyone for uh, joining in. I think this is a very important discussion and I look forward to it as we go forward. And I'll throw it back to the professor. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, it was a nice uh, 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 discourse with regard to how terrorism has panned out after the 9/11. But before we go ahead, you know, on on certain aspects, I missed it because of the technical anxiety that I was facing. I must say that 9/11 was was one of the events which have really stirred the humanity our conscience and also showed the very dark side of violence, which was just not wanted. I urge all of you to kindly hold a minute silence in memory of all those who have lost their life under that eventful day on 9-11 and very unfortunate day. Thank you very much. And I will ask everyone to hold a silence, a minute silence. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, after David, I would like Nayak to invite uh, Professor Madhav Nalapat uh, to give his remarks on this day commemorating, uh, remembering those 9-11 victims. And I would urge um, Professor Madhav Nalapat to give his remarks. Thank you. Over to you, Professor. Professor Madhav Nalapat. Uh, well, I guess uh, there is some technical glitch. Maybe we can continue with other speaker, please. Okay, 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 okay. So the next in line do we have? Okay, it seems that Professor Madhav Nalapat is as as missed it. Anyhow, the, the the thing is that 
when we talk about 9/11 and the lessons that we have learned we come across the different strands which are existent with regard to counter terrorism with regard to counter radicalism anti radicalism with regard to rehabilitating all those who have left the field of terrorism and come back to the civil society more then we have to look into how this terror financing really works what about those people who have been really aggrieved because of this courage of of terrorism and how it has really panned out to the human society as such and what exactly has been the counter measures which have been taken under with regard to global initiatives uh, in this regard and and i i want to really bring about uh, this concern which is with regard to how we are going to address this on a on a universal level how we are going to address it on a comprehensive level looking into the micro aspects of it the social aspects of it the political aspects of it and the economic aspects of it so without much ado i would now ask the next speaker dr vesna markovic she is around if she is around thank you dr vesna yes i'm here okay thank you over to you dr vesna is it okay if i just share a few slides please please go ahead okay so i'm going to share my entire screen i'm just going to share some slides and i'm going to focus on um more specifically i'm going to focus on some tactical changes um with regard to terrorism okay can you see my screen now vesna it's not a uh, yeah now and now it's slowly coming okay so just you know just to talk a, a briefly um david talked a lot about the aspects changing after september 11th and my area of focus and study is suicide bombings um in particular and in this case when we talk about suicide terrorism you know september 11th was a case of suicide terrorism if we look at the 1980s we didn't have many cases of suicide terrorism so we just had three countries most of the attacks were occurring in lebanon um in the 1990s it started spreading around the world more countries had cases of suicide bombings and now we have suicide bombings in over 52 countries around the world and if we look at it over time we'll see that it has increased exponentially it's really increased a lot um and after september 11th it's just incredible number of attacks per per month now you know obviously with coronavirus it's decreased a lot um when we look at the countries that have suicide bombings we see a lot of different countries um but the ones that have the most iraq afghanistan pakistan um increasing in nigeria and yemen and syria um most of them are male bombers that we've seen across this time span although female bombers has increased also a lot in the recent years one of the things i wanted to focus on in terms of targeting um when we look at a lot of the attacks that happen it seems that airlines are a target over and over again for these groups so going back historically to the 60s and 70s you saw a lot of attacks on airports you know they were hijacking planes and then we had metal detectors put into place um in 2001 we had richard reed the shoe bomber who came onto an airplane had explosives in his shoes and you know since then we have to take off our shoes at the airport um in 2006 they made arrests in Luton in the UK um with individuals who were planning on using liquids um as explosives and after that we can't bring more than 3 ounces onto airplanes um in 2009 Umar Farooq Abdel Muttalib the so-called underwear bomber brought explosives on the planes so in terms of targeting not much has changed they seem to want to target airlines or these very major um you know symbolic targets one of the other things that has happened is the vehicular attacks this is inspire magazine from fall 2010 which is an al-qaeda 
magazine, which focuses on vehicle attacks. And this was in 2010. Of course, one of the major, first major attacks using these low-tech attacks, such as vehicle rammings, was the um, Bastille Day attacks in Nice, France, where um, Mohamed Lual Bulal um, hijacked a truck, a big truck, and ran into a Bastille Day parade in Nice, France, killing 86 people. After that, in November 2016, Rumia magazine, which is an ISIS-inspired magazine, um, basically came up with their just terror tactics, um, and they talked about what types of targets to focus on, what types of vehicles to use, um, and suggested targets here. They have pictures of the Macy's Day Parade, and so this became kind of a more prevalent tactic. Um, so much so that in October of uh, 2017 in the US, we had a vehicle ramming attack where um, a gentleman by the name of Saifullah Saipov rented a vehicle from Home Depot, which is you know only $19 a day, and crashed into individuals on um, a bike path, uh, ended up killing eight people in Manhattan. Now, when, why am I even talking about vehicle attacks? Well, part of the problem with these attacks is you mentioned financing terrorism. So attacks like September 11th were very, um, went from the financing terrorism aspect are very costly in terms of the amount of money it takes to put on such a spectacular attack. Um, other smaller attacks, when we look at the attacks in London, for example, on the subway system, you know, we're looking at a much lower um, cost for those attacks. But when we look at vehicle rammings, you know, if you hijack a truck or something like that, it really doesn't cost a lot of money. Now, there are different ways that, you know, you can protect against these attacks. But again, you know, these are lessons learned as we move forward, as we get better in terms of security, the terrorists end up changing their tactics based on how good we get at identifying these terror threats. When we look at vehicle rammings over time, they've increased a lot as well. Um, a lot of them are occurring in France, in the UK, um, some in the US, in Israel, and mostly targeting civilians, although there are some targeting military as well. And then we have mass shootings. So the top two photos are in um, Tunisia. One is in Suez, Tunisia, and one is in the capital targeting the Bardo um, Museum. The one in the middle is the Istanbul nightclub attack. And then the two on the bottom are mass shootings that are terrorism related in the US, the Pulse nightclub attacks and San Bernardino. And then of course the Christchurch mosque attack, which was um, last year targeting two mosques in New Zealand. But again, you know, I'll stop sharing the screen now, but the point is that, you know, it's, it's becoming um, a change in tactics as, security forces are getting better, you know, we're able to catch more of these um, incidents, the terrorist groups tend to revert to less um, sophisticated tactics. So they're not targeting, you know, these, or they're not carrying out these major attacks. And one just final thing that I did want to mention um, was that, you know, 19 years ago, these attacks happened. And I think this is a very prominent incident, a watershed incident that changed a lot of things. In the United States, obviously, law enforcement agencies like the FBI completely shifted their focus from being just, okay, we're a law enforcement agency that is investigating. We are now actually collecting intelligence as opposed to just investigating crimes. And so, you saw a lot of different shifts in federal law enforcement, creation of the Department of Homeland Security. The one thing that's really interesting in terms of lessons learned, 
Um, I'm teaching a class this semester that is a Homeland Security class, and it's to master's students, graduate students. The interesting thing is, um, I, you know, since this week was the anniversary of September 11th, I had them watch a video, um, a very raw video that had video from on the ground, people's reactions to the attacks and the actual um, second plane hitting um, the World Trade Center. And most of the students were between kindergarten and sixth grade when these attacks happened. If you think about that in terms of the new generation that's coming out that is going to be in the field of terrorism, you don't have a lot of historical knowledge when it comes to what actually happened on that day. You have, you know, if somebody's 30 years old now, they were only 11 when the September 11th attacks happened. So give it five, 10 years, all the people that are coming into the field will not have even been born when the September 11th attacks happened. So it's very important for us to keep thinking about, you know, what happened then that day and how can we learn from it and how can we move forward and that it's not just something that they're learning in history, you know, this happened and okay, it happened, what's next? You know, and so it's very important to, to kind of keep that in mind as the future generations come into this field and are studying terrorism and are going to be the ones that are going to be the decision makers in terms of, um, you know, where they're going. And I just wanted to thank, um, thank you for inviting me to speak. I really um, and I'm honored and um, I hope that this is beneficial for, you know, the audience and, and that we can, you know, kind of learn from these, you know, mistakes um, and challenges that we had in, in the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vesna. Thanks. It was really highlighting the different aspects of a new kind of terrorism, which is taking shape. And it was really, uh, you know, enlightening from from uh, your perspective. Uh, but apart from terrorism, the one thing which really comes to the to the mind that you know, whenever you look into this terrorist and their behavioral aspect of it, we come across uh, uh, people who show that behavioral traits that they are really going to do something which might be disastrous, or they show, you know. So we get in every agency, we got certain spotters who look into that kind of people who have a suspicious movement, suspicious activity. And then we look out for what exactly he's doing or following and on all those things. But lately, what we have seen, even terrorists get, you know, certain kind of training to, to somehow, you know, what is called uh, uh, camouflage their behavioral traits, which should not be in a let away that, look, this is something which is really going to happen. We again see that kind of, a, also you, we need to address from society point of view, that anxiety of a person who has seen this happen, you know, they suffer from anxiety for a long period of, of time. And that is what the society will have to address. That is what the uh, people who are in the health sector will have to address so that they get over it and carry on with their lifestyle that they, they, they would have loved to do it. Now this next speaker who is uh, Dr. Weezing, she is on this aspect which deals with health, which deals with you know uh, social society and how it is really looking into the issues of uh, mental health. Uh, so without much ado, I will now invite Dr. Wiesing for making her remarks and 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 inform me what exactly are are the what is called collateral effects which happen with regard to society and mental health of people which have seen that kind of a incident and and uh, terrorist attacks in the past. Thank you. Over to you, Ms. Wiesing. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful event to commemorate such an awful uh, thing. I've sent a PowerPoint. Could that be pulled up, please? Um, so while I, oh, that's great. Uh, what I have been doing um, is looking at the previous speaker's wonderful segue into my uh, conversation with you. Um, everyone has different contributions to make, uh, whether it's macro or micro. Um, I've been uh, appointed as a University of Connecticut fellow looking at extremism as uh, a result of 
education. And so we're looking at how human rights education can buffer uh, violent extremism. I'm the US Child Rights uh, Policy Chair for the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I'm on the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, Human Rights Council because we're trying to make sure that all the scientific community is uh, attuned to issues on human rights. And I'm on the steering committee for Human Rights uh, USA. I'm teaching a course right now on violence as a public health problem. And my focus is in particular on youth. Um, uh, I don't know that I can move my slide. Uh, can I do next? All right, so the rise of extremism has occurred both domestically and internationally now. And so in the US, I'm watching a lot of these terrorist groups. Next slide, please. And we see that the attacks have increased well over uh, 320%, uh, but this is a minor number, I'm sure, compared to what's actually going on. And as we're looking at the socialization of younger uh, people, we can only anticipate that this number is going to increase unless we do something about it. Next. Next slide, please. Okay, and so if we look at the development of groups there, I, I went to different websites trying to pull up a list for you, and there's just too many uh, to even list. Uh, there's some, we can share these slides later if you like, uh, there's some websites about where they are, but there are so many, and in the U.S. in particular, there's small groups, there's a lot of white supremacy groups, there's anti-immigrant groups, uh, but all around the world, the dynamics seem to have a great deal in common. Next. All right, so it appears that the current trends indicate that the international counterterrorism agenda lost some steam um, and that we are really appreciative of what you're doing today to bring into enlightenment uh, more back <laughs> uh, of what we're doing. We know that young men and women um, are being targeted by extremist groups uh, to be recruits. If the extremists can recruit them, the human rights people can recruit them too. All right, and we watch that COVID-19 is certainly stoking a lot of this extremist underpinnings. Now next. All right, so we are looking at all the different reasons and certainly there's many more than we can talk about here, but a common factor is uh, the disparity uh, between the haves and the have-nots. And um, elites are being pitted against um, ordinary people. There's been an attack on academics, on people in leadership positions, um, and this is putting a lot of uh, blame on the economic uh, troubles on the shoulders of governments. And governments need to be attentive uh, to addressing economic disparity. Um, a secondary common theme is that younger people are engaged in more social isolation than ever before. As we see on social media and their reliance upon this, uh, they are spending more time alone than any other cohorts. And the development of networks online um, is an important one. Young people are eager for connection, they're eager for meaning, they're vulnerable to rhetoric that promises them a sense of belonging and purpose. They're looking for ways to contribute to bigger and better um, causes. And this has been, this desire to have your life have meaning and purpose is an important one. Um, so the extremists have been very effective in grabbing onto that. So I'm trying to look to see how we can shift that conversation. Next slide. All right, so how does one encounter this uh, violent extremist view? And simply, attitudes impact action. And so you have young people in particular that are standing at a fork in the road, trying to determine which way to go. Next, all right, so, uh, what influences attitudes, and that is how we socialize children. Um, that this is, in my opinion, I'm a human rights educator, uh, This, and I specialize in pediatric and community <coughs> sociology. Um, I know that socialization is of utmost importance. All right, it occurs in primary and secondary groups, primary groups being like your family, your friends, secondary groups like the school, uh, the, your social networks, the community. Um, we know that role modeling is critically important. 
Uh, we can say if all the things we want, but it's what we do that will impact their behavior the most. I was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Mental Health, and I know that looking at the history of child abuse and domestic violence, that all of this begets further violence. Looking at bullying, we know that the people who are bullies themselves were those who were um, bullied themselves who are subject to violence and they're simply replicating that. In the sociology of childhood, we look at the replication of society and certainly we are at the forefront of this. If we define violence um, as a superior way of addressing things, then this is a difficulty for us. So if we look at this uh, model, we've got this issue of the biased and prejudicial attitudes that we teach children as being appropriate. Um, this will lead to minor discriminatory actions where people talk trash about someone else who do minor things. If these are not subject to interventions, this sets the stage for more major discriminatory actions. If those are not having interventions, then violence and aggression leading to terrorism and the intent to harm, kill and destroy uh, become inevitable. Right, next, please. All right, so we know that we have the importance of the use of sanctions uh, and they're positive and negative, formal and informal. Uh, the uh, positive informal word be like your family, your teachers uh, telling you uh, that certain behavior is appropriate, giving you positive reinforcement for this. Likewise, if a child is engaged in negative behavior that's harmful, uh, moving on it right away becomes an important thing to counter uh, the direction that that will go in that trajectory arrow we showed. Likewise, uh, positive formal sanctions of giving rewards and certainly negative formal sanctions in terms of the military community, the police, in terms of fining people, arresting them and then jailing them are important. Uh, um, next. Uh, but ultimately, I think that the uh, trajectory has to focus back on that very first uh, square where we're looking at how children's attitudes become formed in the beginning. So if we look at who's responsible, we know that parents are primary groups, but also peers, your community climate, the norms, the folkways, the mores, uh, moral presuppositions, the laws, how the criminal justice system works, your schools, your social media, uh, the businesses and organizations, we are all responsible uh, for socializing children. Next. All right, so what part of this elephant can we grab onto? Um, the laws and the military interventions are maybe effective, but I think that they occur too late in the trajectory. We would have better outcomes if we could address the socialization of children early in their lives. But this means that the people who are responsible, especially parents, teachers, uh, the community, have to have support for nonviolence and the importance of human rights. Next. All right, so there's, there's all kinds of information to assist in human rights education. Uh, the uh, UDHR, the Declaration of Human Rights, the um, CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, all of these have built into their treaties the importance of human rights education. UNICEF has the program of rights respecting schools. Uh, you have the Nine is Mine initiative out of Delhi. Uh, you've got partnerships with a variety of human rights organizations. They're developing curriculum materials. Uh, they want them to be used. How can we get that into the hands of people uh, to be effective? Next, please. All right, so we know that we need to find better ways to counter the extremist messages that young people are getting. Uh, this will mean more research on how the extremist groups are working, um, how to better educate uh, both children and adults uh, in formal and in informal settings. Uh, we need to look at the impact and effectiveness of law enforcement and the role of media and social media. Next, please. All right, so in terms of my uh, presentation and recommendations, I think that children are wired for peace, humanity, and joy. Right, Nonviolence is possible. And the exposure to violence and extremist views perpetuates more extremism and violence. Poverty and inequality contribute to the extremism 
and having enough enough emotionally, physically, financially, uh, helps even the playing field. So interventions must occur at the informal and formal levels in order to curb extremist attitudes. So this means that we have a multi-step process where we have to train adults on how to counter violence, extremism uh, through their behavior and attitudes. And then this will filter down and educate children through education through word and deed to see the benefits of human rights and justice. Okay. I'm very happy to help you. I have a network of uh, human rights educators. Uh, if I can be of assistance to the broader community, um, it would be my honor. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Visen. It was really great listening to the social angle of uh, this uh, terrorist attacks and how we can build a better society and how we can bring in more participation from different civil society groups even from the agencies which are involved in you know uh, enforcement and also bringing those people who are just at the threshold of becoming more radical or more violent now uh, th this this also brings to the question that while terrorism has uh, you know uh, taken a different kind of a route or you can say a different time of uh, trajectory over a period of time now we see more lone wolf attacks and then we see more uh, social media being used to really you know flash funding and also bringing in more people uh, into the fold itself now these things have multiplied over a period of time and therefore these countermeasures require much more concerted effort both from the society both from the religious leaders and the enforcement agencies so that a tangible you know uh, results can be really brought to the fore and we can have a really peace and and and, and a, a tranquility in the society which is just, just uh, required in that context itself uh, now i will ask uh, if we have uh, professor madhav nalapat who has joined if he's around i will request him otherwise uh, we, i will ask uh, lieutenant he has joined hello no general kj is there he would be okay, joining okay yeah yeah okay okay we go ahead with lieutenant, lieutenant general kj singh pvsm avsm and bar sir over to you thank you uh, uh, good morning and good evening everybody thank you uh, professor pankaj jha uh, our coordinator and i am really privileged to be with the fellow co panelists uh, as I look at uh, 9-11, I am afraid I have to say that the lessons which were learned have been unlearned. The focus on 9-11 is hardly there. Uh, they say time is a great healer or an obliterator. Uh, the things are well forgotten. The world has fallen into same kind of a routine. And uh, But let me go back to my perspective from the Indian side, what bothers the Indian the most is that terrorism is still classified as your terrorism and my terrorism, the good terrorism and bad terrorism. So we have a situation where Taliban, the original and fun terrible is today USA is negotiating with them. Mainstreaming of terrorist groups is not a bad thing. India has done it. In Mizoram, Lal Denga, the famous uh, insurgent, was made the chief minister. Like they say, put a thief to catch thieves. So it can happen. It can be done. It's not as if it is not a, one of the recommended methods. But then the safeguards have to be built in. Only uh, last week, the vice president of Afghanistan, Amir Saleh, his convoy was attacked. He barely escaped. So safeguards have to be put in place. The, and again, uh, there's some friends from America. Uh, they'll be uh, looking for me on their punching bag tomorrow morning. They'll be figuring that their punching bag has got uh, a figure of mine uh, somebody tying a turban and it will appear and they can uh, like to take few more punches aggressively. Uh, but let me tell you, just eight years after 9-11 or seven years, David Haley anchored Mumbai attacks. 
Who was David Haley? He was a U.S. intelligence operator. Did America not know about him? But they hesitated to share the details with us. So the first and the foremost requirement is a terrorist is a terrorist is a terrorist is a terrorist. There, is, there are no shades to it. Don't go by good, bad. Uh, if you're going to rear snakes in your courtyard, they'll come back to bite. There's no doubt about this. So please, this is one abiding lesson I would like to leave here. The second thing that we all have learned is that expect the unexpected. After all, 9-11 also when it happened, nobody ever thought that you can take aircrafts, learn flying, hijack them, and attack the World Trade Center. Nobody ever thought of it. And Indians, like the complacent lot of people we are, we never thought that Mumbai can be attacked from sea also. So seven years later, uh, Mumbai attack visited us. So terrorists will keep reinventing, keep uh, re-strategizing, and we have hell of a lot of aviation security today. But go back to 9-11. Those people walked through security cameras and they had knives and wire cutters strapped on their backpacks. Cameras couldn't detect it. Things have improved. I agree with this. Intelligence sharing has improved. But has it become seamless? Every country wants to protect its sources. But will there be more David Haley's? I'm sorry, I'll rub it in. Because uh, it pinches me. And uh, unless we learn lessons, there's no point even having discussions like this. And uh, uh, we also have to see that the technology today, there has been this stereotyping of terrorists, that a terrorist is one who's been educated in a madarsa. He's a fundamentalist. He's, a ex he's you know, and we've all put them in a Islamist kind of a package. But all are not, not like this. Highly qualified people like Kafil, who went to attack the Glasgow, was, was an engineering graduate, educated in Australia. Parents, doctors. In Muslim families, you have very few enlightened people like this. Parents working in Saudi Arabia. So stereotypes will not be there. People will go past them. You will have to work. And technology has become a great enabler for terrorists. You will have lone, lone wolves. And lone wolves are the guys who are the most dangerous. Self-motivated on internet. Self-trained. Today it's possible, you know, Pulwama attack. Chemicals were ordered on the online platforms. They were bought through Flipkart and Amazon. So all that is possible. So we have to remain alive to the fact that terrorists will always misuse the technology. We are fighting the proxy war in Kashmir. We block the internet. But do, have we blocked their communication? There are different ways. There are apps like Telegram and many more. And terrorists can always get through. The way, they, uh, you know, long time back when I, I was, not long time back, uh, I was in army and long time back when I was a young officer. Let me go back to that. So we had a lesson on radio. On a, on a radio set. So our instructor asked us that what is required on a radio set to get through. So everybody said frequency and those were those radio sets that you had to tune for antenna current and you had to move the knobs. So everybody said antenna current, somebody said right antenna wavelength and all that was given to him, channels and all this. He said, shut up, you need willpower. If you have the willpower, you will communicate. So terrorists, unfortunately, have the willpower. They are, uh, I always respect them because we motivate our soldiers, but they are more motivated than us. They have decided to take this route. Suicidal route they have decided. So the world will have to remain alive to them. There have been posit positive developments also. Aviation security has come a long way. Emergency responses have 
looked up huge big advances in that uh, uh great leadership qualities were uh, displayed and i salute the uh, civic officials and disaster relief organizations of new york who put that country back uh, that city city state uh, back on rails uh, who you know in in 2977 people died but that included 412 people who were rescue workers they also laid down their life so you have to salute them you have to give them a special salute if you if wherever and uh, i would uh, tend to feel that uh, in 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 nutshell uh, terrorism is going to stay with us it's a uh, it requires very aware citizenry it required seamless integration it requires a philosophy where we do not differentiate intelligence agencies have their compulsions but that should have certain amount of triggers at some level information has to be shared and it is hoped that what america is doing today because after all and also uh, I, i i appeal through you all you are a lot of international panelists here see uh, there is a famous saying that america has lost the wars that it is fought and china has gained at the expense of wars that it has not fought it is chosen not to even get involved now can we have a global power that refuses to take responsibility that says i will do nothing for combating terrorism i'll watch from sideline so i'll watch afghanistan and when the resources come on stream i am copper mines i want to stay i want to take it i will do nothing to resolve the problem between india and pakistan but i definitely want a share of gold mines in gilgit baltistan i will exploit their hydropower i will exploit the baluchistan so that kind of philosophy see you can have a big power but you need to have a great power you need to have a responsible power so i hope these international panelists those of you who do these studies put pressure on china to take ownership to take responsibility and to become an active participant in combating terrorism today their record is zero they doing nothing they were reluctant in united nations with great difficulty they were pushed into some missions they went to sudan gave a very poor account of themselves amounting to cover this but let's leave that aside but uh, my short point is that we have to bring them into the loop to fight terrorism so it's been wonderful hearing all of you you've given some very interesting insights into fields that are not so well known to us as i finish my point let me snatch one more minute we all talk of human rights and human rights for people who are in these areas conflict prone areas i would recommend that we must spare a thought for human rights of soldiers so they go there they expose themselves they put their life at risk they also have families back home they also have responsibilities to meet and if they are uh, pulwama kind of thing happens then there is no cost to be paid that, that that's that's a dangerous situation so do look at that aspect also and uh, thank you professor ja for giving me the stage thank you and uh, like we say in india jai hind Uh, thank you general singh and i respond uh, your jai hind with a equal uh, uh, jai hind from my part and the thing is that when you look into the different aspects of counter uh, terrorism and counter terrorism let me say this at the outset counter terrorism cannot be a business uh, it's it needs more political uh, involvement into the process it needs more commitment and there cannot be and again i stress the fact there cannot be north south divide while countering terrorism if india asked for a 
you know, financial trade from a uh, trail of some terror groups getting some fundings, the European or the US should really look into our request. It's not that you are asking uh, India and many of these developing economies with regard to relay, you know, the funds and, and, and economic trail. And then we provide it with a very sincerity, with a very diligent outlook. But this should be also reciprocated in the same way. The second aspect, which has been very clearly highlighted by General Singh itself, that somewhere down the line, the tech int has failed. Because whatever we are doing, the terror have terrorists and the terror modules have gone a step ahead. And they are using that primitive model, models of uh, indoctrinating and even recruiting people and verifying whether this person is a serious candidate for this terror recruitment or not. Maybe it is high time that we should look into human aspect of it, how human intelligence can be really you know, enhanced and how, how this collaboration between different nations can be done at this point of time. Without much ado, now I will invite uh, Professor Madhav Das Nalapat uh, to, to uh, put up his 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 thinking on the subject matter over to you professor nalapat thank you thank you pankaj uh, i am really honored to be here because of your commemoration of 911 and actually for me and my wife lakshmi it's a bit personal because we were a few kilometers away from uh, ground zero during that day staying in a hotel called the lexington hotel i think it's now it changed its name to radisson uh, in, in Lexington and, and 46th. And uh, I mean, you know, actually my wife was supposed to go to something called Windows of the World, which I believe uh, was on the World Trade Center that morning. And fortunately, she changed her mind uh, early in the morning and didn't go. I mean, I, I know I'm deeply grateful that, uh, that she changed her mind. And after some time, people rang us up and said, are you watching TV? So we, uh, we said, of course not. Why would we watch TV? Watch TV. And then we saw what was happening. And of course, we, we went out in the streets and we saw from far away smoke and um, you know, vehicles going there. And in the night, we saw a very solemn uh, procession. We, we took part in that, a candlelight procession. And that essentially showed the resilience of the people of New York. I mean, you know, they were calm, they were peaceful, they were confident. And I think it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a tremendous, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, the ter a terrible day. And it, uh, for, for all of us, it was a tremendous uh, day for all of us in the sense that it gave us the courage to believe that people can fight this kind of horrible evil. You know, uh, you know, Pankaj, I don't want to take more time on these personal reminiscences, except to say that one of the things that I frankly abhor terrorists for is the fact that in the old days when I used to give some lectures at the University of Georgia, I used to go fly down, you know, we, we fly back from Atlanta maybe 30, 40 minutes before the flight was supposed to take off. Uh, the Delta usually, in, the, in you know, in that period, and race through the airport and then catch the flight with maybe 10 minutes to spare. And you know what's happened after that. The whole world has changed, unfortunately, and these terrorists have made that change. So it's one of the many ways in which they have changed our lives and it's one of the many reasons why we need to fight them. Having said that, let me go on to 9-11. And let me go on to, you know, to the genesis of 9-11, where essentially was a kind of a, if I may say so, again, you know, the general has made some comments on US policy. Uh, if we, I mean, if you don't mind, I'd like to add my own two bits to that and point out that the Clinton administration was in a sense, the, the, he, I mean, he, the President Clinton was the godfather of the Taliban. Uh, I remember in those days in the 1990s, I mean, P.V. Narasimha Rao was the prime minister and how the Taliban was, in a sense, incentivized to capture power in Kabul. And you had an assistant secretary of state in the State Department, uh, uh, you know, facilitating that. And they came to power. And then you had people like Zalmay Khalilzad going and meeting them on behalf of UNOCAL saying, look, I'm making this much money. I can make money for you. Let's share the money we have. I mean, frankly, uh, I mean, you know, Bill Clinton in Kashmir, for example, India has been fighting these jihadi organizations for quite some time. And Bill Clinton put enormous pressure on India to essentially surrender Kashmir to the jihadis. So I'd like to say 9-11 was no accident. 9-11 was something waiting to happen 
because of the mistakes of the past. And then what happened? 9-11 took place. And of course, then again, well, what happened? The United States very correctly went into Afghanistan and took out the Taliban. And then what happened? Lo and behold, the arsonist, the, the group responsible for nourishing the Taliban on behalf of the Godfather, uh, that, uh, that country, that military, is again made the primary ally in the war on terror. An army that is that is nourished terror, that's got jihad as its motto, that has got terror groups operating in South Asia and across. Well, that army was made once again the ally of the United States in the war on terror. Is it any surprise? And as I said, I've been you know, tracking this for quite some time. And I would like to say, we saw, and I think India and Afghanistan, our relationship goes back a long way. I don't know if, uh, how many of our friends are aware. We have nearly a million Afghan refugees in India, of which about 800,000 are Pashtuns. And they're moderate Pashtuns. And the mistake, of course, that was made in this uh, war on terror in the 1980s and the 1990s was basically that, and of course, beyond that, the moderate Pashtuns were ignored. And the fanatic Pashtuns were empowered because the Pakistan army was regarded as a conduit through which to funnel recruitments. And of course, Saudi Arabia and everybody else. The Pashtuns are a moderate people, were a moderate people, but the moderates were eliminated from leadership structures. Guns, money and training were put into the hands of the minority of Pashtuns who are fanatic. And we all know what happened. You had the Taliban. You had uh, fanaticism, you had uh, terrorist groups. Everything came as a result of, in the 1980s itself, the mistake of not going with the moderate Pashtun majority, arming them, training them, monetizing them, and setting them forth. Well, uh, you know, I'd like to jump a bit and talk about what's happening now. Kurdistan, the Kurds are moderate. United States very correctly, you know, finally decided the Kurds are needed against ISIS. And they, they were deadly fighters. They worked against ISIS. And lo and behold, you have President Trump embracing Erdogan and basically you know, creating a situation in which Erdogan can march in and betray the Kurds. I'd like to know how many people will now trust the United States as an ally after what has been seen of the Kurds. Or, of course, in the past, what has been seen of other groups in Iraq, etc. in the past. But it's a different matter. Let's go back to Afghanistan. Let's go back to the Kunduz, for example, in which a large number of, of foreign fighters were airlifted out, courtesy the Americans, by the Pakistan army. Let's go back to the fact that the, you know, the Pakistan army would say, ex-warlord is a moderate. Well, in India, we've been tracking these warlords pretty extensively. They're trouble for you, they're trouble for us. And we knew that ex-warlord, if he's a moderate, well, then you, you, the, the only in comparison to somebody like Adolf Hitler, the man would be a fanatic. But then you have these very trusting people. Yes, if the Pakistan army says he's moderate, he must be moderate. Give him money, give him guns. And that is how the Taliban got rebuilt. It got rebuilt on American guns and American money. Because these so-called warlords who are moderate were about as moderate as Mr. Bin Laden. Were, were, was a moderate. They were not moderate at all. But this is what you get when you use defective instruments to fight a war. And, and this is exactly what happened. I don't want to go on and on about what's happened in Afghanistan, except to say, I never thought, you know, I thought there'd be a bottom to this, but that I didn't, you know, I was surprised when that bottom was crossed. And now you have again, the American administration signing a deal with the Taliban and a deal which is against the Afghan state. Well, the Afghan state is not, uh, I mean, they have their people who are making money. There's no doubt about it. They have some other people, but they don't at least ensure that women are sent to concentration camps, that they are shot for, wearing, for not wearing some dresses, that they're not sent to school. At least they don't do that. They don't have a situation in which music and television and uh, movies are banned. And then you embrace a group that favors all that. Fortunately, only about 13% of the Afghan population is in the territory controlled by the Taliban. 
territory where they have imposed this on women, imposed this on moderates, imposed this on the Shia, forget the Shia, Hazara, uh, what their fate was under the Taliban, what it is under the Taliban. And this is the group with which the United States has signed an agreement in Qatar. Qatar, of course, has a very interesting history of dealing with such groups as the Turkey. I'm not going to go into that. But all I would like to say is that the war on terror, please understand that just because you have a mass of data in front of you, just because you speak a language perfectly, unless you can go into the minds of the people of that area, unless you can understand, as uh, Pankaj just now said, human and human beings, and don't see everybody as a machine or as some kind of a computer generated or artificial intelligence generated readout, well then, you're going to make these mistakes. Frankly, the war on terror has become much worse because of what Trump has done with Turkey, embracing Erdogan, what he has done with the Kurds, sacrificing the Kurds, and what he has done with the Taliban. He's gone the way of Bill Clinton. So there's not much difference, frankly, between him and Bill Clinton so far as this concern. I'd only like to say that in India, we have been facing this monster for decades. And fortunately, very fortunately, till now, we have managed to keep the monster at bay. And recently, we were subject to some very vituperative attacks by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on something called, you know, something called Article 370. What does Article 370 say? It says that in, in, citizens of India have the same rights in Kashmir as Kashmiris who are Indian citizens have in the rest of India. If you don't like that, then please ensure that some parts of the United States are reserved only for specific religions or ethnicities and others are not allowed to come in there. Because 370 was a monstrosity for a secular society. And it created an illusion that, that you can treat one people of a particular faith because a state has got a majority of people of a particular faith you treat it differently from other states. Sorry, whether you are a Muslim majority state or a Christian majority state or a Hindu majority state, everybody should be treated the same. That was not the case under 370. And if Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have any objection to that, I hope in their you know, states, in California and Delaware, they will implement a 370. So any location where you have a large population of a particular group, ensure that nobody else comes in. That was Article 370. What I want to say, point out, I have great respect for Joe Biden. And if you check my writing, I've been supporting Senator Harris for the last four years, including against trolls who are very upset with me for having done so. And I continue to support her. I think she's a wonderful person. And my faith in Joe Biden went up about a thousand times after he got Kamala Harris over as his vice presidential pick. And of course, it's not just because you know, in the Kamala is has all, it was also my mother's name. I mean, you have Kamala Harris, and then you have my mother Kamala, and I've got a small bias to anyone named Kamala, to be frank with you. But I only want to say, look, India and the United States, in the, after 9-11, the government of India offered to join hands with the United States in the war on terror. Dick Cheney and George H, no, sorry, George W. Bush, brilliant minds that they are. No, no, what is India going to teach us? Let's go with Pakistan. Well, Pakistan means the Pakistan army. And I don't know if Mr. Cheney has read about the Pakistan army motto of jihad. I don't know if Mr. Cheney has read the textbooks in Pakistan, which say some pretty nasty things about some, some particular groups of people. I don't know that. And I'd like to point out, I am completely unalterably secular. When people killed Muslims for eating beef, I wanted them to be arrested under terrorism laws. If people go and, and you know, fight against women in any kind of form, I would like them arrested as the human rights violators. I believe a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian is the same. And fortunately for us, our, our people of any religion are moderate, including, I'm proud to say, the Muslim community. The Muslim community, we have 200 million Muslims. They're overwhelmingly moderate. And thank God for that. Anybody who considers otherwise, frankly, doesn't know what he or she is speaking about. So I'd like to say where I come from, 
I come from a very secular, what I call a progressive liberal background, except on one or two things, and that is security and the war on terror. I believe terrorists are evil. I believe that we should fight them. And I believe we should fight them in an intelligent way. And lastly, let me end by saying, I believe India and the United States should take advantage of an opportunity lost by Cheney and Bush. And now India and the United States have to join together in fighting terror. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nalapath. It was really a really straightforward talk. Uh, and nice to hear you. Uh, uh, so it concludes you with regard to all the presentations which have been made. And uh, uh, I just wanted to raise a few of the questions which really crossed my mind while really listening to all of you. The biggest question which comes, uh, it is nearly two decades after 9-11. Is this whole narrative related to education that illiterates uh, will only join terrorist fold and educated people will not join the terrorist fold is completely you know, destroyed. Uh, now you find very highly qualified people joining the terrorism and doing all kinds of incidents which is very uh, threatening to the human lives. The second thing which comes to the mind is whether these legal laws, whether when, when, when there is a talk with regard to human rights and all those things, how much, what exactly is the threshold where we can take care of human rights, but beyond that, we should consider, you know, issues of uh, state security, human security. And, and, and that is a very, what is called very, very uh, debatable question. And, and that is how we should really look into how much is, is acceptable in this discourse itself. So without much ado, I will, uh, I have a few of the questions in the chat box. I will address it to each one of you. The first question which is coming is from Subhan Chaudhary. He says that uh, this idea of cultural war provided by Huntington is becoming ever more prevalent. So the wars are becoming uh, even more intracultural in these kind of situations. So how do you think that the UN and other international NGOs can intervene in these situations? So he just wanted to make it a general point if anybody wants to come in and, uh, and, and answer to this. The other question, I will take a slot of three questions each. The other question is by Shitij Nayak, and he says that this is for properly for Dr. V. Singh, that solutions, uh, what uh, uh, is the solutions for the children who reach schools? However, what about the students that could not reach schools uh, can be efforts to make through social media because like you said that you are ready to speak on or take on causes very easily and positively or negatively. So how can you educate those children which are not able to reach schools and, and provide that education which is just required so that they can get into the social uh, fold as such. And, and the third question which is again by uh, Mr. Shritij Nair, he talks about that uh, and, and this uh, U.S. has adopted a, a wonderful process of keeping an eye on illegal immigrants. And this is a question is open to any panelist, whosoever wants to speak. And their actions inside the country with their border security forces operating even uh, uh, within its borders, which has increased gathering of intelligence and has reduced terrorist threat. But why has India not adopted something like this? And can it adopt something based on the U.S. model? So these are the three questions I will ask the panelists. Uh, in the order they, had, they have made presentation, I will ask Professor Madhav Nalapath to go first and then we go accordingly in a decreasing order. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll be just very brief and say that I am optimistic for mm. the simple reason that back in 9-11, uh, um, I mean, Mr. Bin Laden and his people were supposed to have blazed a trail. But subsequently, I would like to say the United States spectacularly, uh, largely because of the Treasury Department, uh, more than anything else, they they chase the money trail. They put a cap on that. The world's largest democracy, India, also was very successful, is very successful in fighting terror, mainly, as you said, Pankaj, by reliance on human intelligence, significant human intelligence. And I'd like to point out that in Kashmir, please understand, India's Indian security forces never used helicopters, never used artillery, never used uh, aircraft, never used any of these uh, you know, instruments of war that have been used by countries multiple times in fighting terrorists. It's, uh, that has been costly, as, as the general will tell you, in terms of the lives of our very gallant soldiers. But 
as but the fact is it has kept the terrorists at bay in a way in which it has not been kept at bay in pakistan and afghanistan so i just want to say i am optimistic frankly but about education i want to point out you know you study central asia and again this has been happening completely under the under the gaze of the united states the russian education system collapsed guess what took their place people came in from saudi arabia they came from qatar they came from uh, other locations in the middle east and they started filling the uh, education syllabi curricula and uh, staff with uh, with wahhabis i would have frankly i am no friend of the, i mean of, of communism or the of the soviet union rather i preferred a soviet curriculum to a wahhabi curriculum all this happened in front of uh, our eyes and nothing was done you know so across so many parts of the world even today you have the most terrible kind of curricula which teach you to hate different kinds of people you know and uh, this is something which really needs attention because ultimately i'd like to say it begins at the school yard it begins with primary and secondary education and we have to ensure that our children understand why it is important to be moderate why it's important to not be fanatic and why it's important to know our society is not vertical we don't have high low middle it's horizontal we are all equal but in different ways but i just want to end pankaj i am optimistic that like it or not the terrorists in my view are losing and that's why the counter wahhabi force is growing even the saudis for the first time and al saud mohammed bin salman has come out against wahhabism wahhabism and the al sauds were linked like dna strands and he's come out against wahhabism so i think that's a very helpful sign it's a sign of hope for the world but there's a lot more to go thank you thank you thank you general kj singh yeah the one point which was regarding the homeland security model which america has got what we have to see is that america has no real borders which are threatened if you take migrants from mexico that's a different thing and trump's formulation is very questionable after all strength of america today is based on people who have come there if you go back to trump family also they have also been immigrants it's not as if they have been original red indians over there so that uh, notwithstanding india has borders which has got complex demographic challenges so for us to adopt such uh, uh, us type of uh, formulation is rather difficult india is india is a different country you have to accept it we have never used heavy weapons against terrorists and right next to us sri lanka exterminated uh, completely by using all kind of weapons pakistan uses gunships artillery every weapon it can use it uses against uh, in this radul fasad and all such kind of operations we don't do it we are quite controlled in our caliber and we do not uh, up the ante unnecessarily so that's our formulation we have to live with our values that's those are indian values the second issue that i want to just quickly touch is that indeed clash of civilization is getting sort of uh, heightened it is manifesting in places where it was not there earlier world has to remain alive to it on education aspect uh, madrasa education has to be reformulated science and uh, it and all these subjects have to be gotten there they have to be skilled traditionally in india at least muslims were artisans they were good painters good mechanics and they took on these kind of trades good embroidery uh, makers so why can't we focus them back over there and use their inherent strengths so these are few things that i would like to say but i also remain optimistic uh, terrorism will never win the agencies and states will always find ways to this thing and way what is most important is 
the states have tremendous amount of patience they will stand up they will devise ways but they will keep the terrorism thing control to finish it is is difficult and we'll have to continuously strive for that thank you professor thank you thank you thank you again. thank you thank you thank you thank you general singh now i will ask dr v singh and then dr vesna please hi uh the question is what do you do about human rights education yes. in yes. if students are not in traditional schools and i think this yes. is a very um insightful and an important question um i've made some notes that i would like to use to address uh my response um first i think that whoever controls the mind of a child controls the future so it is of utmost importance to socialize them in the early years uh toward a human rights respecting approach um and so if we go and look at teachers teachers often have not taught this because they can't teach what they were never taught um in my country we've looked at curriculum and found that there are almost no human rights courses ever taught at the primary secondary or university level and this is why i'm trying to work with the uh advancement of science organizations uh trying to institute a curriculum that enforces this uh some uh countries do better than others but the issue that is raised on uh what do you do uh if you are not in school i uh, so some children never go to school and we know this is true we have religious schools and in many ways they are indoctrinating children to see the world in a particular way so the uh professor uh, general's view that uh, there's good terrorists and bad terrorists my view is right yours is not i think that's an important thing to look at with religious schools because uh many of the schools have been perpetuating views about others that are not in a human rights respecting approach um we find this uh to be raising importance with covid there's more homeschooling going on now um children are learning remotely um they are online uh parents don't know what they're doing uh necessarily with respect to the curriculum much less to have an addition of a human rights component in most schools human rights is an additional thing that um if you have a dedicated teacher they add in uh but if they're not dedicated to that um it's easy for that to go the behind math uh how to read how to write and so on um so this is i think a problem that the um questioner is wise to raise about how are we going to deal with education human rights education in non-traditional settings in developed worlds they may be in public schools but in less developed countries a bunch of the education goes on in informal um settings so if i work uh with people in africa indicated that uh even toddlers in uh the early preschools are learning about human rights um and yet uh, we have others that never learn anything at all about it the informal educators are an important group um that we really do need to consider under that umbrella it's not just you know public school um anymore you've also got the dangers i think of for profit educators coming in trying to sell especially in less developed areas um online education at extreme cost that um i think that they're proprietary i think that they're predators um i think i'm a real dedicated person to the importance of public education that is overseen by credentialing organizations uh with some government oversight for good quality um having a free for all with all of these uh new predators uh trying to make a, a money off of promoting particular kinds of education i think we have to be very wary of those um so in the last comment i would like to make is that the uh, uh un convention on the rights of the child says that every decision that a community uh makes has to be in what is seen as the best interest of the child all right and so i think that is a good principle to go back to um as we start to look at education but um it's correct i think that we are in more danger now of about using education as a vehicle for human rights uh than perhaps before because of the covid um situation 
So I don't have any good answers today, but I'd be happy to research that. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, Dr. Vesna? Hi, thank you. So I'm just going to focus on part of the question because I think Dr. Vissing is the expert in that area and covered, you know, what she needed. But in terms of the U.S. and, you know, the policies with border security is not as uh, simple as um, it seems. We obviously have had uh, some issues after September 11th, the Department of Homeland Security was created, and that was meant to kind of um, consolidate the efforts and put under one roof, um, house under one roof, uh, all these agencies that would be protecting the homeland. Um, part of the reason was to help in um, in communication. But again, when we look at uh, threats from the outside, when people cross over from Mexico or Canada or any other border, um, you know, a lot of them are coming over to look for a better life in the U.S. and not any threat whatsoever. And so um, where we do have some problems, and again, when it comes to law enforcement, um, it's not the policy of law enforcement to just follow people when they come into the country. There has to be some legitimate um, issue or, or legitimate potential threat or something in order for them to even come up with the idea to like, for example, for the FBI to run surveillance. So they can't just follow people randomly. And, you know, sometimes it fails because they can't follow them 24 seven for long periods of time. One, it costs a lot of money in order to do full surveillance. Uh, the teams are at least eight people watching one person. Now, if you have mobile surveillance, that's a little bit more. For a 24-hour period, you have three shifts, so that's at least 24 people. So you can't do this for long periods of time. It's just not possible. And so like we saw with the Boston bombers, right, we had intelligence from foreign services stating that, you know, these, these, this guy in particular, the older Tsarnaev brother, should be looked at, and they... They did take the case, they did open up an inquiry, they did do surveillance, but during that period of time, nothing happened. And so they have to, at some point, just stop the surveillance if there's no additional information that they've found. And as you know, they carried out the attacks um, during the Boston bombings. So I think part of the thing is that, going back to that clash of cultures, in the U.S., we're a little bit more well, nowadays it's been a little more rocky in terms of, um, you know, hate between groups and between cultures and, you know, having tolerance towards immigrants and all that stuff. You know, I think we were more, we would less alienate groups, which made it more of um, a welcoming society, so not as much of a threat um, in terms of people wanting to actually carry out attacks or target. Um, but now the rhetoric has increased and there is little tolerance for, you know, fill in the blank, whichever culture. And, and we are a nation of immigrants. Everybody immigrated, unless you're Native American, everybody at some point immigrated from somewhere else. And so, I think the rhetoric that's been surrounding, um, you know, let's say the last three, four years has been increasing. And I think that's going to lead to more problems, um, maybe not terrorism per se, but at the very least hate crimes and other types of violence. So I wouldn't say that we've adopted necessarily a wonderful process here. I just think, you know, when you don't, have alienated segments of the community, you're going to have less violence just in general. So as um, segments of the community get more alienated or become, you know, to or feel that they're inferior or anything else like that, or then are targeted as a minority or something like that, I think the violence will increase here as well. So I don't know that, um, you know, we have to look at non- violent solutions, again, military or 
police force are used for certain things, but shouldn't be used um, in place of, you know, other means and methods. And again, you know, children are taught to hate. They don't come out of the womb and hate people, right? They learn these behaviors from people around them. And so that's where, you know, we need to focus on in terms of, you know, preventing future, um, you know, preventing future incidents from happening. Your David, your comments on the questions which have been really raised. Over to you, David. Devi, are, are you there? David? Kindly unmute yourself, please. Oh. Anyhow. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry. You know, old dog is hard to learn new things. But I wanted to, to kind of respond. Uh, to what Vesna uh, very um, beautifully articulated, and, and that's in response to a couple of comments were made about the, the immigration system here in the United States. Um, I agree with you. I mean, this is a complex uh, issue here, and it's, it's, it's good to hear that others think that we've got a handle on immigration. I don't want to talk about the political uh, part of it. Um, it's like you said, Vesna, I mean, my family came from Germany, so we're all immigrants. But one of the uh, issues I'd like to point out in this forum is that one of my baseline um, kind of rules of life at this point is that when Daesh, the Islamic State, says something, we need to listen because they have been uh, very adept at foreshadowing its operations throughout the world. One of the things that the Islamic State has said, even as early as 2017, is that it plan to infiltrate the U.S. southern border uh, with uh, terrorist activ activities. And I think last year about this time, there was actually an event uh, where an ISIS defector kind of outlined the plans that, that Daesh had to, to bring uh, terrorists uh, through, the, uh, through the southern border of the United States and then upward throughout the country. So for me, border security is not just this kind of political issue that we've got going on very intensely right now in the United States, but it's one of those lines in which we have to pay attention to what is being said by both terrorist and extremist groups. From my perspective, it's been very difficult for uh, our law enforcement agencies on the southern border to try to understand at which point or which groups uh, may be infiltrated with um, uh, ISIS or Daesh uh, 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 soldiers, so to speak. And I think that riding on all of this from my perspective and my specialty is, and I heard it from uh, you know, my colleagues as well. Yvonne talked about it in terms of radicalization. She talked about it in terms of what's going on in terms of education now being virtually uh, done throughout the United States and throughout the world. Radicalization online is, is where we have really, really kind of failed uh, as, as a country. I'm talking about the United States since 9-11. Uh, we, we as a government got caught way behind, way behind the curve uh, in terms of the effectiveness that uh, the Islamic State, for instance, and other extremist groups have shown in terms of reaching uh, fragile populations, fragile individuals, and radicalizing them. We've also kind of, I think, think been behind the eight ball in terms of understanding how the, the online world, the information environment online through social media, uh, has been used by these groups to, to raise money to um, actually affect tactical operations. I, I think that it goes back to what maybe Vesna uh, had mentioned early in, in her presentation about this kind of uh, demographic divide that we have in terms of, um, you know, we have people now within the, the U.S. military who were so young when 9-11 happened they don't have that institutional and historical memory. But I would say that there's a flip side to that. What I notice in my work with the US Army is that 
that that kind of age divide between uh, general officers and senior officers and then uh, the lower ranks of the military, and I think General Singh can probably speak to this as well, on that upper end from general officers, they're in the age group where, gosh, they really didn't understand social media. They didn't understand uh, the power of being able to reach out to an individual in Minnesota and radicalize that individual as uh, has been done by not only the Islamic State, but also extremist groups uh, that are very active in this country right now. The general officers, the senior commanders, they're at that age level where, gosh, it's just, a, it's just something that we, we don't have a handle on. The younger officers uh, and the younger people who are involved in, in government now here in the United States, while they may not have remembered September 11th like uh, we all do here today, um, they instinctively understand the power of social media and how to use it effectively. And, and so in closing, I would just observe that uh, one of the things that Islamic State has done very effectively uh, is to be able to harness the power of social media and to use it as a tool for their uh, strategic objectives. And I think um, it's not just Islamic State. The Taliban, when I was in Afghanistan, did a pretty good, good job uh, of, of affecting propaganda online. And I think now we see in this country with some of the social unrest and, and social justice issues, uh, groups using uh, the inter internet in a way that is an extremely dangerous tool uh, if it's seen from that perspective. But so I just think that uh, the United States government got caught way behind after 9-11 after and understanding the information environment. Um, and, and I have more confidence now that the younger people who may not have understood 9-11 from our perspective is, is in, in our age groups, uh, but they do understand uh, how to navigate and how to uh, understand social media and the platforms that exist and the power that they represent. So for me, that, that age difference is actually something that I think uh, gives me a little bit more confidence. Thank you. Thank you, David. We take a, a next lot of three questions. Uh, this one question, which is with regard to, you know, uh, one of these aspects which have been addressed by the David with regard to use of social media, but there is a related question with regard to cyber terrorism and whether there is a need for a multi-nation coalition to combat such methods adopted by the terrorist itself. Uh, I, I would like David to come back on this, uh, and this is specifically addressed to you as such. The second aspect which which uh, the, one of those attendees have raised, you know, with regard to how we can, the countries can uh, adopt soft tactics. We have talked about, you know, hard tactics, military tactics, countermeasures. But is there a, 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 a you know, a, a roadmap how we can really adopt this soft tactics with regard to combating terrorism? And I will ask either the ladies in the house, Dr. Wiesing or um, Dr. Vesna, to really address it from their point of view. And And the third question, which is, uh, which is there that uh, 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 what exactly if you if you look into this from the social point of view and all those things, what exactly is the trends which highlight that why many people join these newly upcoming terrorist organizations? Because now we find that you have Daesh, which is a uh, which which has shown that how a de facto state can exist, uh, and and this this has also. Uh, raised some some measures with that that this kind of a whole configuration can emerge in the global power structures where where a non uh, state actor can emerge so strong and which needs to be taken care of uh, also there is one question which is addressed that whether upcoming us elections could affect the structure of security built for the us and does it pose any threat to the country or the world peace given the fact that has been very soft tones which have been adopted by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And, and, and the last question uh, in this thing is that, that uh, whether this whole issue with regard to Taliban and which have been raised to have US-Taliban agreement, will it raise another phase of uh, attacks and terrorist incidents in India's Kashmir? Maybe that is one of the Indian speakers might like to speak on that. And that's all. Okay, I will ask David and thereafter Dr. Vesna, then V Singh, and then General Singh, and 
last uh, Professor Nalpath, please. Thank you. Well, you know, on the political stuff, I want to stay away from that personally. I'm just not into um, in politics per se, and I think we've got a lot of a lot of deep issues going on in the country right now, and I can't shed any light on on any of that. One of the things I would like to ride on, however, is that what we're seeing in the landscape here in the United States, um, both the right and left wing, uh, in terms of that spectrum of extremism has become in increasingly very active. And, and riding on uh, a point made in, in the slide deck that Vesna uh, offered us, it had incredible statistics about the use of explosive devices uh, by these different uh, types of groups ranging from Daesh all the way over to right-wing extremism here in this country. If you could just share my screen there just a second, I'd like to show you some statistics um, that kind of are revealing in terms of uh, what we're seeing here in the United States that you may not realize. Um, if somebody could help me share that screen, um, is, that, is, is that being done, Professor? Can you help me share my screen? If you just scroll down to where the microphone is, yeah, you'll see on the right-hand side, it says present now. If you click okay. there, you can share your entire screen. Uh, oh, I appreciate that. I've never used this uh, platform before, so this is all very, um, is the platform, is that down at the bottom of my screen yeah, here, exactly. or is it? Just on the right side, there is an option called yeah. present now. Click on that and then what uh, happens? <laughs> it will yeah, ask well, for your entire screen, a window or a Chrome tab, yeah. whatever is okay with you. Okay. Well, i tell you what's happening is, is my computer is bringing up the toolbar, uh, the well, scrolling can, toolbar that I have. Me, you can email me, sir. Okay. You well, my yeah, my point would be that uh, we did a study uh, at TRAC uh, in 2019. It was actually a roll-up of explosive devices used here in this country uh, in, in 2019. It was really, really re uh, revealing. Um, even in a state like North Carolina, well, where I'm located right now, we had something like 29 uh, incidents that involved explosive devices. Um, that list went all the way down to there was 27 incidents in New Jersey, 25 in Pennsylvania, and and we showed that there was an increase in IED related activity here in this country. So, if you if you think about counterterrorism activity and and you think about how we go about, uh, and from a law enforcement perspective, from an intelligence perspective, in identifying uh, the landscape, we have to learn what's going on, but. Uh, through international terrorist groups, uh, and we've seen the same sort of tactics being adopted uh, from uh, left and right wing groups here in this country that were taught to us by international groups such as um, ISIS or say the Taliban or Al Qaeda. Uh, and, and I think that all of that goes to the lessons learned that we are speaking of here today. What have we learned? And I, I think uh, uh, General Singh said it best, we, we, we've, we seem to have learned a lot, but we seem to have learned not too much. Uh, and so um, what, from my perspective, uh, it, it goes beyond politics. If you go back to the southern border issue, uh, we've got to do a better job of identifying what the extremist groups are saying, and they usually say it out there in social media. Uh, and identify that, assimilate it, analyze it, and then affect some kind of um, tactical response to it. So uh, from my perspective, whether we're talking about radicalization, uh, that's an Yvonne's specialty, or we're or talking about tactical operations, uh, the, the landscape online is really where we need to be paying particular attention to what's going on. And again, that seems to be a generational divide uh, and I feel more confident that you know, as younger people, younger professor, professors come through the uh, system, um, they have a better handle on that than we have had in my age group. And I'll turn it back over to the professor. Well, I guess there is some technical glitch. I would now request uh, 
uh, and move on to the next speaker, please. Vesmar. Okay, hi. Um, and I, I apologize, after I make these comments, I'm gonna have to leave. I have another meeting to get to. Um, so if there are any additional questions after I'm done, if you can notify um, GCTC and they can get those questions to me and I'd be happy to answer them. So right. I, I know part of the question was focused on um, cyber terrorism and cyber threats. That was one of the questions that I see in the chat that was directed to me. And, you know, in this country, we haven't had um, major threats from cyber terrorism. So cyber threats, absolutely. So cyber threats, um, as you've probably seen in the news, uh, a lot of the stuff that's been going on in the last election and this election with regards to potential meddling from outside using you know, cyber means, and also from the monetary perspective, which is um, you know, the threat of you know, using cyber attacks to make money and be disruptive, but also, as David mentioned, um, the the ability of ISIS to recruit using social media. Um, their, you know, Al Qaeda had their magazine, Inspire magazine. ISIS has their, you know, Dabiq. Then they had Rumia. Then they have now another one. They keep changing, but their their ability to reach a large audience and a and a large population is is very, you know, scary. Um, when you see some of their videos that they were um, focused on with recruiting, they were targeting, you know, families. They were targeting younger, both boys and girls, to come to the Islamic State. Um, they showed videos of doctors coming from Australia who are now working for the Islamic State and, you know, opening hospitals and treating the the warriors that are heroes and all this stuff. So, you know, they definitely are, are much more adept at using social media than Al Qaeda was. And so that also remains a threat where, you know, even videos like um, if we think about videos um, such as the Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, um, their former emir who uh, was killed uh, via U.S. drone strikes, but, um, you know, those videos live on on YouTube. So even though you kill a person, you don't kill an idea. And so that's where this problem comes into play a lot because, you know, people who are looking for, you know, they might have some ideas or thoughts and they go searching on Google or somewhere on YouTube and they can find you know, these videos of speeches that were made and they can find the information that they're looking for and they can even self-radicalize. So they don't even necessarily need to leave their country to go to another theater of conflict, such as Syria or somewhere else. They can just stay in that location and then, you know, carry out attacks because they espouse that ideology. Um, now, with regard to the upcoming, you know, elections, there is as David said, I don't, I don't want to get involved too much in politics just because that's not my area. My area is tactics, look, looking at financing suicide bombings and terrorism in general, and the actual tactics used by terrorists. So that's my focus. But um, as I pointed out, the vehicular attacks, that has increased. Um, I don't know how closely people follow the news here in the U.S., but a lot of these protests, that are focused, you know, Black Lives Matter um, protests, there have been vehicle rammings there where um, either if a car has been surrounded and then they drive off and, and so, or if it's been targeted, specifically targeting the, um, but these are things that we're having more a, a bigger problem with in the U.S. domestically than we are from, you know, threats from international terror at this, at this juncture. So, um, yes, the, elections are going to have a potential impact on, you know, what happens going forward in terms of security. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times when a new president comes in to office or if it's the same president gets reelected, you know, what happens? What are the threats from the outside? Are people going to test that new president? So there are a lot of things that can 
you know, change in terms of um, what could happen with this um, election coming up in November. Uh, so again, I, I apologize, I have to leave because I have another engagement that I have to get to, but I wanted to thank GCTC for having me as a speaker and to thank my um, fellow speakers. Uh, this was very informative and I, I look forward to working with you all in the future as well. And I, you know, I can post my, um, in the chat, I can post my <clears throat> contact info. It'll be my email address. So if people have questions for me, they can contact me and um, I'll stop now and give somebody else a chance. It was very nice to meet everybody and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Vicente, please. <clears throat> Dr. Wiesing, are you there? Oh, yes. Uh, in terms of the question about so have, uh, soft the soft tactics, um, I have a few thoughts that I would like to share with you. One is based off of the UN's uh, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child Treaty. They have uh, basically three components and they talk about the three P's of provision, protection, and participation. And I think that some of the uh, terrorist organizations have really seized on the provision aspect. If you're hungry and somebody is offering to feed you, then that is a very good recruitment tactic, right? And yeah. so uh, I think that looking at uh, how some of these organizations have worked, uh, they've really soft peddled uh, their way into it because they're taking care of providing um, the housing, the food, the water, healthcare, and so on. Um, another uh, component on that would especially be participation uh, that i think we as a community need to be providing options to engage uh, young people uh, to find positive outlets um, the tactic that the terrorist organizations are using to give a sense of belonging that they matter that you can do this for a larger well-being of a group um, could uh, be extrapolated to a human rights um, agenda and approach uh, toward community well-being. Um, it's very interesting, my work with uh, people and looking at human rights is that they don't want uh, some people to have human rights because if you have them, then it takes away from me. And the notion that if I have a right, then you're respecting mine and I'm respecting yours and actually the well-being of everybody is enhanced instead of it uh, being decreased. Um, I think that's an attitude that we can uh, really seize uh, to work on, um, especially through the uh, use of social media. Uh, the terrorist groups are using media very effectively, and we have dropped the ball on that, and we could be doing much better um, with respect to that. And uh, so I'm trying to uh, figure out in my research about exactly how they're doing this, how are they getting into it, how are they recruiting, because it's not just on Facebook anymore, right? Um, so we have to really get um, much smarter about that. Another soft uh, approach uh, would be um, to be looking at uh, teacher training. Um, again, uh, if you can't teach what you don't know. And so I think we have an obligation to make sure that teachers know more than the uh, uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic uh, approach, and to look at that socio-emotional learning, that SEL, uh, that we really talk about uh, positivity and uh, how to intervene in ways that are nonviolent and see that as an effective mechanism. Um, the health community uh, needs to be brought into this. Uh, even working with pregnant uh, women on uh, parenting classes, parenting um, is often not viewed to be an important we do exactly what our parents and our grandparents did to them uh, it's an ineffective model in lots of ways so uh, looking at that um, looking at the courts um, looking at the child welfare institutions uh, when reports are made a lot of times people don't know how um, and it's lack of um, 
education, uh, not lack of uh, wanting, not intent to harm. All right, so uh, trying to provide um, better options uh, for that. And in terms of the government, I'll wait in. All right, uh, my two uh, previous uh, scholars didn't want to go there. I think that we're finding that the increased number of violent uh, crimes, hate crimes uh, groups, is directly related to uh, some appreciation and endorsement of uh, the administration. I think that we need to have people say this is an unacceptable response. Uh, for instance, they had a Kenosha, Wisconsin killing where a 17 year old young man uh, was carrying an AK, uh, uh, was it 15, uh, and killed people. And instead of this being seen as an intolerable uh, behavior that uh, received a lot of condemnation, uh, many people said, oh, he's really a hero. This is really a good response. Uh, let's credit him. And I think that having a, a leadership at the national level that states, that human rights are important and that the intolerance uh, and extremism is unacceptable for the well-being of individuals, for families, uh, and for society as a whole uh, is an important thing. Thanks. General Singh, please. It's here. General Sun, yeah. you want to make some remarks? I am I'm here. Yeah, I only wanted to address this question in specific mm -hmm. about uh, what kind of uh, effect it would have on proxy war in JNK, Jammu and Kashmir, if Taliban comes to power. Well, uh, now Taliban is trying to repackage itself into a more responsible kind of uh, formulation. We hope it does it that way. It is also thrown out some feelers to India that we are not necessarily anti-India. India is uh, in a very mature manner, not trying to vitiate the environment. It is staying out of it, despite it being uh, something in our neighborhood. So the situation that obtains today is that there are questions. We are worried uh, what kind of effect uh, Taliban ascendancy will have on proxy war. It will give some kind of fillip to their ideological uh, fervor, which is there with Islamists. That, of course, will happen. But Taliban will have to realize that uh, nothing is permanent if it uh, breaches the line then the regime change will start. That is there. But we have, India has to remain cautious. That's all I can say. And Professor Nalapa, please. Well, I guess Madhya Nalapa sir, is not there. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Wait, if so, I could respond to so, a general saying there, yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead. David. General Singh, I, I really agree with you. And I think tomorrow is going to be really instructive about the way all of this is going to go with the Taliban. I think what's going to happen in Doha uh, is just going to be one of the most significant, uh, what, eight, eight or nine hours that we've seen on this issue uh, in the last 19 years. Um, as uh, some of you may recall, when the, the, the Taliban uh, opened its office in Doha, I think it was in 2013, uh, it, it didn't go so well from the perspective of the Afghan government. Um, the, the, uh, the office raised to the Taliban flag, and uh, okay. that created this uh, conflict between uh, the Karzai administration on that issue. Uh, so I'm going to be very interested to see what happens in General Singh. I know you, it sounds like you're going to be following that meeting very closely tomorrow. Um, I vacillate between hope and despair uh, when it comes to the Taliban. Uh, and uh, you just mentioned that it appears that they've been acting, trying to act more responsibly in, in recent months. Uh, certainly, we've seen uh, some decrease in activity uh, in terms of uh, uh, kinetic activity from the Taliban in Kabul, for instance. 
but we've also seen some upticks from other groups in Afghanistan. So all of that kind of is stirred together, as you know, better than anybody, uh, especially from the perspective of being right next door in India or one one country over. And that that is something that we can't uh, I discount, uh, is that it is really a soup there. Uh, and tomorrow is going to be very significant to see how the government and, and the group come together on some of these issues. Uh, David, uh, I would just make a short counter to your, while I agree with you completely, what has happened is that as Taliban is becoming or pretending to become more responsible, yeah. there is a competitive radicalism which has come yeah. with ISIS. So Daesh has made its entry in Kabul and people from my clan, Sikhs, are being thrown out of there. There have been attacks on Gurdwaras. So yeah. it, it's a quagmire. One doesn't know. And, and it's very difficult to believe that ISI doesn't have a handle on all these people. So yeah. will ISI prop up Daesh or I, ISIS over there to keep Taliban in check? Because it also needs a counter to Taliban. So these are all very interesting times, like you say. We at our this stage we'll watch it with interest and hope that uh, this model of making Taliban responsible succeeds. We will yeah. hope in that. And again, without making a, a political a partisan political statement uh, here, General Singh, I, you know I was. Uh, heartened by the fact that when the Trump administration first came into to, uh, office, uh, it seemed to want to deal with the, the Pakistan part of this equation in ISI. And, and uh, I think that maybe there's been a lot of work behind the scenes that we're not aware of on, on ISI. Um, I'm not sure where the administration, how far it's taken it in recent months. Um, certainly, I think that um, the negotiations between the U.S. and the Taliban were as complex as you can imagine. Uh, but the real key is, how is the very disparate uh, Afghan government going to come to terms with the Taliban? And, and I guess beginning tomorrow, we may see how that's going to unfold. And, and maybe you and I should talk offline uh, tomorrow because it sounds like we're both kind of play by play uh, kind of spectators looking at this. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be tuned in for sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's a good chit chat between two people who are watching Afghanistan. But, uh, a, a, you know, over a period of time, uh, we have seen this uh, terrorism has taken different shape. There are questions with regard to this, you know, subscription of Al Qaeda and Daesh over a period of time. One, what exactly will be the future of terrorism per se as such? Uh, but overall, it was a very nice discussion, and and I, as a moderator, thank all the panelists, uh, Mr. David, uh, Dr. Vesa, uh, Dr. Vizing, and uh, General Singh, and Professor Madhav Nalapat for providing good inputs and good insights about the whole debate. And in fact, it's a work in progress where all the developed and developing countries will have to come together, because otherwise, uh, it might happen that the things that we have been avoiding might be the most emergent situation which might crop up in front of our eyes and we have to take certain countermeasures which might not be acceptable from the social point of view, from political point of view, but then these are the incidents and the events, something like September 9-11, which have brought about a course change and a, and a serious thinking on how to counter terrorism as well as radicalism at different levels within society. Uh, I rest my case, I thank GCTC, and I give it over to the GCTC for any vote of thanks or any concluding remarks whatsoever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> all the eminent speakers, it was a very, very wonderful event. I request you all to stay till the very end because we have a tiny performance. So the theme of today's uh, conference was good trumps over evil. And what better way to present it than in an art form? We have our research coordinator, Mayuri Paul, who will be performing a dance for us to depict the very same.